On the service bench is a Tektronix Type D plug-in unit. This is a vertical amplifier for a 500 series oscilloscope. And this particular one was made in 1964. And in this video, we're going to discuss the proper soldering techniques for the ceramic strip construction that Tektronix was so famous for. So let's take a look underneath the plug-in. And this is representative of the typical oscilloscope construction used on the 500 series throughout the 50s and 60s. And you can see with the ceramic strip construction it provides a, a very aesthetically pleasing neat and orderly layout of all the passive components. And it's also very easy to service. As you can see, unlike conventional terminal strip construction, the components here just lay inside these notches and they're soldered into place. So leads are not crimped or bent over or anything like that. So from a serviceability standpoint, this is really much easier to work on. And one of the critical things that need to be understood with the ceramic strip construction is that a silver bearing solder absolutely must be used on all of the joints. So let's see why that is. So like the name implies this is a ceramic strip and these notches here actually have a silver coating on them. So some people might think that this is actually uh, some type of silver or metal insert. It's not. It's actually a painted on silver coating and it's essentially baked onto the ceramic. And the reason that silver is used is because silver bonds very well to ceramic. And it's critical again that you use the silver bearing solder when making any type of connections or repairs. And the reason for that is is that if you were to use conventional solder like 6040 or 6337 which is just an alloy of tin and lead common electronic grade solder the molten puddle of that type of solder uh, will essentially dissolve the silver um, on the ceramic strip and it'll basically leach off and blend in with the molten puddle and you can get away with that type of repair maybe just once. And I speak from experience saying that because I've tried it just to experiment. And this particular plug-in unit's a parts unit, so it's going to be sacrificed for the sake of education here, so to speak. So again, you have to use silver bearing solder. And the original alloy used by Tektronix was a 60% um, tin, 37% lead, and 3% silver. However, you can no longer find that particular alloy, that composition rather, um, but you can still get this from Kester and a few other manufacturers. It's hard to find, but it's 62% um, tin, 36% lead, and 2% silver. So it's just one percent less silver but that little bit of silver is just enough to prevent the silver from leaching off of the ceramic uh, strip so again this is the solder you want to use and if you can find a roll of this these days it's about 75 bucks and this is .031 and it's a type RA flux, it's 3.3%, so very close to the original thing. And just for the sake of the argument here, this is the 6040 solder, which you absolutely do not want to use. So like I said, you could get away with the repair once, but don't even do that. So I don't even want to condone doing one repair. It's just not worth it. So, and here's what's going to happen. Let's say you use the 6040 solder, okay, and a lot of techs did because they just didn't know. And you make the joint, and it might be okay. Let's say the solder didn't flow that well and you wanted to redo it. If you reheat it again, if you pull out the solder, 
then you're actually going to pull off the silver with it, like I said. And then when you try to resolder it, the leads might the leads will solder together, but it's not going to be um, adhered to the ceramic strip. So mechanically, you have a compromised joint. So very critical to use the silver solder. So to compound things, not only is the type of solder important, but so is the solder temperature. And here's my Weller soldering station. It's a WRS 1002. It's basically just a solder vacuum. So you just press the little button here and it actuates a vacuum pump. You have a gauge there. And that gauge will tell you if the filter is blocked or not. So when I experimented with multiple temperatures, so I purposely started at a rather high temperature. I started at 730 degrees Fahrenheit for a tip temperature. And you'll, you'll see what happens here. So this might be kind of hard to see. So some of these joints, they don't look too good. They're kind of ugly, but again, that's because it was temperature experimentation. See how the solder doesn't look like it really filled up too neatly in this notch? You can just slightly see some of the plating is gone. And in this case, that's not because of the improper solder. That was because the temperature of the solder was too hot. And the, so the uh, silver started to get pulled off when I actuated the vacuum with that 730 degree tip. So you don't start to see the silver separation until about the second try, second or third try. But regardless, you're going to say, well, you know, you're going to do one repair, it's going to be fine. But that first repair is compromised if you're not doing things just right. So I want things to be done as best as possible. So you need to have that uh, temperature set as low as possible while still getting good flow. You don't want to damage the joint. So I experimented, uh, you know, at 730 degrees. I brought the tip temperature down. I brought it down as far as 500 degrees Fahrenheit. But at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, the dwell time of the iron was just too long. And then you're starting to transfer too much heat into the component as you're waiting for the solder to melt. So that's no good either. So I brought the temperature up to about 550 degrees. It seemed like it was getting better. And, but at 575 degrees, the dwell time didn't seem too bad and the solder was able to take pretty well so I had nice solder flow at 575 so that seems to be a very comfortable temperature to melt the solder and not uh, not be too hot so let's take a look at this joint here if the camera will focus I'm going to turn this a little bit. It's trying to focus on the front of the panel. So you can see this joint isn't soldered right now. And what I was doing throughout my experimenting here, I would solder, remove the solder, solder again, remove the solder. I did this a few times because I wanted to check the integrity of the connection after multiple attempts using the 2% solder. 2% silver solder that is and I'm happy to report by the way that this particular type of solder works perfectly for this application so there's no concern there so and I practiced this joint at the 575 degree tip temperature and at multiple attempts no plating loss was noted so that's very good So here I'll set up the, we'll do a quick solder connection here. And I'm going to use my, even my soldering iron here, the desoldering iron. I know it's really not the proper tool here, but I don't have the other iron warmed up. But you'll get the idea.
So the technique here is to actually heat up the component lead first. But in order to get the action going, just like any type of soldering, you want to get a little bit of solder on the tip. And then that's going to start the heat transfer into the component. And then you're just going to kind of hold the iron onto the ceramic strip. And then slowly feed a little bit of solder into the notch. And then that's it. It flows nicely. And you're totally done. And the thing here to also note is that you do not need to fill up the entire notch. Just enough solder to complete the connection. And when you're done, you want to use some flux remover. You could either use some flux remover like this, MG Chemicals, this is good stuff. Or you could just use lacquer thinner. Lacquer thinner works fantastic for removing um, rosin flux. So that and a cotton swab, you know, a Q-tip like this, and just wipe it right on there. It'll take all that flux right off. It'll look perfect. So that's basically the concept. And one other note here, um, you should check on YouTube if you haven't already. Uh, Tektronics has a page. It's actually run by volunteers of Tektronics, basically former employees. It's called Vintage Tech, T-E-K. Um, and they're basically preserving Tektronics history. And they've uploaded a lot of great videos of their past um, onto their page. And they also have a web page called Vintage Tech, too. And it's dedicated solely to the history and preservation of these uh, vintage instruments. Fantastic website. And hats off to Tektronics for taking the time and allowing you know their history to be preserved like that. So, in fact, there's also a video from the early 60s that was geared towards the production people on proper soldering techniques. So some of that, of course, I cover in this video, but we got a little bit more detail because, you know, it's 2019 as of this recording, and, you know, for the last, you know, many years we've had these types of soldering irons, right? So we could really dial in the temperature and make it just right. Because, again, we don't want to compromise the integrity of this construction because if we don't follow the proper techniques, these are very easily damaged. But once again, follow proper protocol and you've got no problems at all. And they're a lot of fun to work on. So check out Vintage Tech and hope this video helps you out. Thanks for watching.